Good evening. I'm Wendy Chung. Welcome. We're going to be speaking this evening about gene therapy and several immediate applications that are already being realized. And I'm joined tonight with many of my colleagues who I'll introduce in just a moment. For those of you who are expecting to spend the evening with Max Gomez, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but he wasn't able to join us, so instead you've got me. Um, but uh, I hope I'll be just as entertaining and informative. Um, I'm joined, as I said, by colleagues from Cornell and Columbia this evening, and these are really premier doctors who are at the cutting edge in gene therapy for each of their areas. Um, they're going to provide you with some real insight, I think, into what both is being done currently as well as where the future is going. Um, just starting to the left, at least on my uh, sort of uh, Hollywood Squares. I've got Dr. Joshua Milner. Uh, he's at Columbia. He's an immunologist, uh, specialist in things that have, are related to the immune system. And you're going to see a pattern amongst the areas that we're talking about. Um, the next is Dr. Monica Batia. She's a bone marrow transplant specialist at Columbia. Here comes the connecting uh, piece of this. The bone marrow is uh, an easily accessible tissue in terms of the hematological and immune system. And that's where we're gonna be focusing a lot of our discussion this evening. Um, and Dr. Batia has certainly been expert in bone marrow transplants, but uh, I would say we're gonna try and put her out of business and be able to think about a new way of thinking about this with gene therapy. Uh, Dr. Sue Sujit Cheth, uh, I won't embarrass him, but is a very long-term uh, friend of mine. I didn't say old, notice that, but um, uh, uh, Dr. Sheth is a hematologist specifically, and he's really um, dealing with what I think is one of the most important conditions in terms of gene therapy, that of sickle cell disease, given globally as we think about um, just the number of individuals that could be impacted. Um, and then finally, Catherine McGunn. Um, is a hematologist at Cornell, uh, also where I should have said that uh, Dr. Sheth is, and she thinks about another hematological condition, that of thalassemia, also worldwide and globally when I think about this, just the literally um, tens of thousands, if not, Katie, you'll have to tell me, maybe it's hundreds of thousands of individuals affected with thalassemia. So. Um, anyway, this evening, I'm just going to uh, start out a little bit in terms of uh, giving you a very broad overview and introduction, and then we're going to go straight into some of the conditions and how we're starting to think about things. Um, so as a geneticist, I'll say that uh, although we think of some of these conditions as rare, they're really not so rare. That's one of the things I want to emphasize. And we know about already 7,000 rare genetic conditions, but when we think of them collectively, actually 10% of us have one of these conditions or have had one of these manifestations of these conditions. So they're individually, they might be rare, but they're collectively incredibly common. Um, and when we think about gene therapy, you're gonna hear there are different ways of being able to do these therapies on the gene. But let me be very clear that we're not talking about anything like gene enhancement. So in none of the cases we're gonna be speaking about, nor do we endorse anything that's being able to make a superhero type of person. We're we're really thinking about alleviating uh, pain and other things that impact individuals in a negative way. Um, and we're also not talking about dealing with the germline. So we're not talking about things that we'd be transmitted to the next generation. We're talking about things that are in the body of the individuals to make them healthier and give them more fulfilled lives. So those are just the boundaries that we're going to talk about today. Um, within this, as I said, we are going to focus uh, especially on things that are in the bone marrow, either the immune system or the uh, blood cells, because that, as you're going to hear, is an easily accessible tissue in terms of being able to do this. But I'll tell you, I hope that within my lifetime, we're going to go far beyond that and be able to think about really any part of the body that we might be able to help with some of these technologies. And so we're going to get into some of the down and dirty in just a second. I'm going to let each of our speakers uh, give an introduction in terms of what they think about uh, and what they're working on specifically in the area of gene therapy. And then we'll come back to some questions overall. So I'm just going to go in the same order that I did with the Hollywood squares. Um, and so as we do this, uh, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Milner. Tell us what you've been thinking and working about in terms of the immune system. So I'm Josh Milner. I'm a pediatric allergist and immunologist. And uh, the diseases that I specialize most uh, closely uh, on are those that involve when the immune system is not policing itself correctly or immune dysregulation. Um, and so these can still be genetic diseases that lead to autoimmunity or inflammation or allergic disease. Um, and they may or may not have infections as part of those diseases. 
Um, these are, by virtue of the fact that they are genetic diseases and they come from the bone marrow for most of these diseases, um, the, the cells that, that, that cause the disease, um, it certainly would seem possible to be able to change a gene in the bone marrow um, and uh, give it back to a person so that it is not uh, causing the problem um, that leads to the lack of the immune system ability to police itself. Um, it is its own set of difficulties to change a gene instead of just replacing it. Um, and uh, that is something that we are working on in models of the disease in different ways and via colleagues and collaborations as well. Um, but um, in the immune system, that's one of the newer frontiers um, is to edit as opposed to just replacing something that's not there. Monica, tell me, uh, are we going to be able to put you out of business? I always think that, um, maybe. Um, so I am a stem cell transplant physician. Um, I initially had worked on diseases such as cancers where you could cure um, these diseases using a bone marrow transplant where these diseases originally originate in the bone marrow which produce either abnormal red cells, white cells, or platelets. And by um, essentially wiping out someone's bone marrow and replacing it with healthy bone marrow from a donor, whether it be a brother, sister, or an unrelated donor, um, you can reconstitute a healthy bone marrow and essentially cure patients of their underlying disease. Um, for most of my, you know, my career, I have really focused on hemoglobinopathies. So I have done bone marrow transplants for patients with sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Um, the problem is this is a genetic condition. And so while outcomes are quite good in these patients who are undergoing transplants with either a brother or sister match, um, only about 15% of these patients actually have an appropriate donor. And so because of that, we have to go to unrelated donors. Um, and there's many more complications with these patients in terms of it not working, what we call graft failure, rejection, something called graft versus host disease, which is an immune response of um, certain cells called T cells that can essentially attack a patient's organ and cause a lot of downstream complications. And so the lack of appropriate donors is also concerning in this patient population because <clears throat> unfortunately sickle cell disease is really um, a disease of patients of African-American origin or Hispanics, and they're not very well represented in the bone marrow registry. So other ways to help cure these patients of these, this debilitating condition include something like gene therapy. And there are several clinical trials under, underway right now and uh, that are extremely promising where you can either um, insert using a vector, um, a therapeutic gene that will essentially um, help um, ameliorate the, the disease condition, or you can actually edit the genome such that you turn on different genes to help, um, again, alleviate some of the symptoms. And so these are some things that we are involved with here at Columbia um, and New York Presbyterian in general. Um, and so that's kind of where I've been focusing my attention because I think you know, outcomes for patients who have a, a brother or sister match in sickle cell disease are about 95%. Um, whereas when you use an unrelated donor, those outcomes drop to about 75%. I think in general, we know patients with sickle cell disease, unfortunately, have a median life expectancy of about 50. So if there is any way that we can help cure these patients early so that they can live normal productive lives without pain, some of the other complications like stroke, infections, um, you know, that's kind of where I've kind of focused my, my uh, attention. I hope we get to that day soon. Sujit, um, and I apologize, actually, Katie, I misspoke earlier, um, but uh, Katie's going to be talking about hemophilias, and Sujit's going to tell us a little bit about some of the um, sickle cell disease and thalassemia. So Sujit, tell us what you've been up to. Thank you, Wendy. And, and, um, uh, it really is a pleasure to be on this panel and, and try and, and stress on the unmet need for these diseases, sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Um, and even though Wendy was very charitable, I am old. Um, I had no expectation that in my lifetime, we would be at this point where we were actually talking about curing genetic diseases with gene therapy. So I really am at, at, at very, very happy that we are at this point. Sickle cell disease is a terrible disease, one of the worst chronic diseases of childhood where your life expectancy is about 35 to 45 years 
Um, this is a condition that affects about 6 million people worldwide. And there are about 300,000 new individu individuals born with sickle cell disease every single year in, in the world. And with that life expectancy in the US being 35 to 45, you can imagine what the life expectancy is in the continent where this is most prevalent, which is Africa. Um, it, you, it has a very, very high mortality rate under the age of five years, under the age of 10 years. Um, so it is a dreadful disease to have. The other condition, which is thalassemia, is also a bone marrow condition where you don't make normal red blood cells. This affects several million people around the world. We don't have an exact estimate. It's most common in Asia. Um, and it's estimated that about 40,000 individuals are born with this condition requiring regular blood transfusions all of your life. As Monica mentioned, and, and again with thalassemia too, the life expectancy is in the 30s and 40s um, in the US. So you can imagine that it's much lower in the developing world as well. As Monica mentioned, transplant is a curative therapy for both of these conditions. And if you are transplanted, you can live a near normal life expectancy, given that the first transplants were done in the, in the 80s. We don't really know that. But we estimate that given how well these individuals are doing. But as Monica again mentioned, only 15 to 20% of these individuals have an ideal donor, which is a matched sibling or a matched uh, related donor to have the best outcomes from transplant. When you do these transplants with um, mismatched donors or um, unrelated donors, the risks are much higher and therefore the mortality is much higher as well. So to be able to insert a gene or edit a gene and cure these individuals really is an amazing thing to be able to, to, to say that we are act actually able to do. And just as an aside, one of those gene therapies, one of those insertion gene therapies for thalassemia was reviewed just last week by the FDA and was very favorably looked at as well. So this is definitely something that is going to come to the fore and be clinically applicable in the short-term future. So thank you. Very exciting, Sujit. Katie, what about uh, in terms of bleeding disorders, hemophilia? Great. Um, so, I mean, I think hemophilia is, is, a, is a wonderful model of a disease to really look um, sort of at what the application of gene therapy can be. So what hemophilia is, is that um, our patients are missing a blood clotting factor, which means that their blood doesn't clot normally. What it means is that it puts them at risk for bleeding and the bleeding can happen anywhere and you know, sort of with very minor trauma. Um, and so these children are at risk for having significant bleeding events from the time that they're born sort of all the way through since it is a genetic disease that we're talking about. The nice thing is that we have um, models to be able to elegantly replace the protein that's missing. But one of the challenges to really think about is that the best way that we have to deliver the replacement clotting factors is through a vein. And so what this means is that we teach parents of sort of toddlers how to do um, venous infusions um, at home to be able to replace their clotting factors to try and prevent bleeding. And this is challenging um, to think about sort of accessing a vein at home so many times and, and, you know, what that looks like over the course of a lifetime, as well as that, you know, there's times where you're still at risk for bleeding, despite some of these um, advances that we've had in the way that we can replace the clotting factor proteins. So gene therapy and hemophilia, it's a wonderful model to really think about is that what we're doing is we are adding, so gene addition. So unlike some of the editing or some of the, you know, kind of the other um, fancy techniques that we need to do, what we need to do is to be able to replace what's missing. And the nice thing is that we have a way to be able to measure that very easily, um, sort of by sampling, you know, a simple venous draw can tell us how much clotting factor. In hemophilia A, um, it's factor eight. Um, and hemophilia B, it's factor nine. And these are rare in the sense of that, you know, kind of, I think we're, you know, as you mentioned before, that we're dealing with rare diseases, but not entirely uncommon um, that we see this. So there's about 400,000 people who are living with hemophilia, about 200, about 20,000 here in the US. And we have about 400 new babies every year that are born with hemophilia A, just to give you an example who would benefit from this type of therapy once we have you know, the idea about how to do this properly and really be able to think about a long-term way to, for them to be able to prevent bleeding and let them live the lives that they wanna live. <laughs> 
Okay, so all of these great examples. Um, so let's get down a little bit to the mechanics of the gene therapy itself, because you were using some terms that I'm not sure everyone in the audience was familiar with. So there are things that I heard about gene addition, and some people probably know that there are viruses that do this, and viruses I think everyone's worried about a little bit these days. People were also mentioning this idea of gene editing, and I, I don't know how many people are familiar with all of these. So does anyone want to get sort of demystifying, get a little bit into the technical detail, and how do we actually do this? I mean, is this just you pop a pill, or you know, how, how do we actually get the genes in there? Who wants to so I think I think let's do this in two parts. So I will try and explain the editing and the insertion part, and then I'll leave it to Monica to explain the actual mechanics of how this happens. Okay. okay. So when we talk about gene addition, we're trying to add a gene to a particular cell to allow it to function, right? The, the major problem in both thalassemia and sickle cell anemia is in the beta globin gene. The beta globin gene is, makes beta globin, beta globin binds with something called alpha globin to make your hemoglobin molecule. The hemoglobin molecule is what transports oxygen in your body. So if you don't make beta globin normally as in thalassemia, or if you make an abnormal beta globin as in sickle cell disease, then those red cells don't function normally and they die prematurely. With sickle cell disease, this causes a whole bunch of different problems, including a, a lot of pain, a lot of organ dysfunction, and eventually leads to organ failure and a shortened life expectancy. In thalassemia, you don't make enough red blood cells. So your body is not able to get enough oxygen as a result. And therefore you are dependent on transfusions to maintain oxygen delivery to your tissues. And that means transfusions all of your life and all the complications that come with those transfusions. So given that this is a beta globin gene problem, they, the, the wise scientists who were working on this thought, why don't we insert a normal beta globin gene into the stem cells in the bone marrow that produce these, these beta globins. And so they had two approaches. One was to insert a copy of that gene into the stem cell. And then once that stem cell starts to work in the body, it makes normal beta globin. The other approach was to edit the stem cell, the edit the genome in the stem cell to try and knock out some um, inhibitor of gamma globin production. So gamma globin is the other globin that binds to alpha globin to form hemoglobin molecules. And you can substitute the gamma globin for the abnormal beta globin and still make hemoglobin that transports oxygen. So both of these approaches have been used to add a, a gene and that is done using a viral vector. Most typically what we, what we use is a lentiviral vector. Um, and that's the gene addition approach. And the gene editing approach is done by two main uh, techniques. One is something that I'm sure many of you have heard about, CRISPR, right? CRISPR is a, is a buzzword in medicine these days. And CRISPR is one way in which you can edit a, a, the genome in a cell and um, have the effect that you desire. And so both of these things are done on stem cells. And I will let Monica explain how it's done in the stem cells and then how these cells are given back to you. <clears throat> um, thanks, Sujit. So, you know, I think from a practical point, I think people need to realize this isn't kind of like Wendy mentioned, this isn't like a weekend stay, this isn't like a pill you pop. I mean, it is kind of a journey. And I myself, once I started doing these trials, I was also quite a learning curve for me. Um, and I also was pretty naive to, you know, the, you know, you really do have to be quite committed to be part of these trials. So as Sujit mentioned, what we need to do is change the stem cells in, in a patient to produce functioning red blood cells. And so stem cells are produced in your bone marrow. Bone marrow is a liquid cavity that's in all our bones. Um, you know, the biggest bones that we usually collect bone marrow from are the hip bones. Um, but what you can also do is stem cells are produced in the bone marrow and essentially go into the bloodstream where we collect them, what we call peripherally through an IV. And so typically what patients with either sickle cell disease or thalassemia have to do is um, <clears throat> they need to get injected with um, something called chlorixaphor, which is a mobilizing agent 
that helps to stimulate the production of these stem cells into your periphery. Then the, the patient, either through two large bore IVs or through a catheter that's placed under anesthesia, is connected to a machine. The machine then collects these immature stem cells these, um, and gives the patient back the rest of the cells. These stem cells are then taken and then sent out to a lab and whichever technique is being done, whether it be the gene editing approach or the gene addition approach, um, these are done in a lab. <clears throat> and the hope is that the majority of these stem cells will be what we call transduced with the type of um, treatment. It may not happen um, overnight. Um, sometimes we need to do two cycles and that requires the whole process over again. And this can take sometimes one cycle or two cycles or three cycles even, and these are about four weeks apart, which would require then more anesthesia, another catheter, et cetera. Um, obviously the more stem cells we collect, the better the transduction of the vectors. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty clear, you know, something like sickle cell or thalassemia, over time the bone marrow does weaken as well. And so typically children actually mobilize stem cells a lot better than adults. And so adults tend to need to do this process multiple times. Um, and then the process of the transduction, making sure that they undergo all the safety precautions, et cetera, that typically takes about four to eight weeks. Um, and then the cells are returned back to the center. Then the patient is then admitted. Um, and so the patient is admitted to undergo, undergo high dose chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy essentially wipes out the patient's old bone marrow in order to make room for the new bone marrow. These, um, these modified cells or transduced cells are then infused back into the patient where they essentially, and that through, the, through an IV and they essentially hone to the bone marrow. And usually what we've seen, it takes about three to four weeks for the patient to accept these cells, even though they're their own cells in essence, um, it still takes about three to four weeks. Um, and what we have found is most patients go home relatively quickly after that. Um, but during that period of time, their blood counts are extremely low. They're at risk for infections. They're at risk for other complications. The nice thing is because it's their own cells, the risk of rejection is very low or none. And uh, the, the, the issue of graft versus host disease, which is a real problem in patients with hemoglobinopathies where donor cells essentially attack the recipient because of the mismatches. Um, that's not there as well, which makes this such an attractive option for patients um, who don't have appropriate donors. Um, but, you know, obviously they still have to undergo high dose chemotherapy. And I think that is the downside because with that, there are other challenges such as infertility, um, organ damage, um, heart, lungs, kidneys. Patients with thalassemia already don't have the most perfect livers because of the iron deposition within the liver. So, you know, unfortunately the chemotherapy for now is, um, is, is what we have, but hopefully in the future that that may not be necessary, such as what Katie does. <laughs> so Katie, tag your it. Um, so it, it, even though yours is about bleeding and you might think of that with blood, treatment, gene therapy treatment for hemophilia is a bit different. Do you wanna tell us about how it, how it actually plays out for your disease? Absolutely. I want to like separate myself out from um, my colleagues here, just in the sense of that, um, you know, doing the gene therapy procedures for hemophilia is much easier. Um, so what we are talking about is not chemotherapy, not admissions to the hospital. So what we um, sort of are um, pioneering in the treatment of hemophilia gene therapy is to do a one-time um, outpatient um, infusion um, at you know kind of an infusion center that you would get to be able to deliver um, sort of the, um, the package essentially that's gonna deliver your new gene. So what that really looks like is that it is a virus as you said that we use, but I really wanna kind of emphasize it's a virus that doesn't cause a disease in humans. And so it's non-pathogenic and it doesn't sort of um, replicate. So it doesn't sort of um, on its own, it's not able to kind of survive, um, you, you know, for a long period of time and grow in the body. What its job to do is to be um, 
to be a delivery mechanism. Um, inside is the new gene um, that we are missing. So in the case of, of hemophilia B, it's a factor nine gene that is gonna produce a factor nine protein. And we might choose a version of that gene that you know kind of is the best version of the gene that we're kind of aware of, one that would be able to make the most protein um, in, in being able to kind of do the most good. And so we would put that kind of inside the package. We do an IV infusion um, over the course of about an hour or so. And then we'd watch and we would wait and we would see, you know, kind of how the body accepted um, that, um, that delivery mechanism. The target of that delivery mechanism in hemophilia, our goal is to get that to the liver. Um, and these um, sort of non-pathogenic viruses are attracted to go to the liver on their own. And so they go there and the goal is to get the, um, use the machinery of the liver um, cells to be able to synthesize the protein and then have the protein that's available in the bloodstream. And so that is, you know, kind of what we would see. And we would follow very closely over the course of the next three months or so to see what the factor levels of the way that we can measure the success of our gene therapy um, in the blood looks like. There may be challenges. I don't want to kind of minimize it um, in that sense is that there are some people who have some immune responses um, to this and do need additional medications. Um, but that sort of that initial phase is very different than what we're talking about in terms of the risk and benefit um, that goes along with sort of directing to the um, to the bone marrow um, more specifically. Great. So there's uh, Josh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there's another part of the body that you might th not think of based on what you've been hearing about so far, but the eye. I know you, I didn't introduce you as an eye doctor, but yes. do you want to tell us a, based on well, some it, eye gene therapies? It, it just so happens to be that I know a little bit about um, eye gene therapy uh, because I have a daughter who has something called labor congenital amaurosis, <clears throat> which is a genetic disease uh, that causes blindness. Um, and, um, and so obviously I've, I've, I've researched that as, a, as, as much as possible as a, as a parent and not as a doc, but you know, we can't really uh, make it as clean of a difference uh, as the two like that. Um, and in, in that particular case, um, uh, similar uh, to in some ways to the hemophilia case, um, it's a single injection into each eye, um, and often it started with just one eye uh, to make sure that everything goes okay, um, again, of a, of a virus that's been um, cooled off so that all it does is deliver a payload um, of uh, a gene that replaces the non-functioning gene in the eye, um, and it's absolutely remarkable. It, it, it allows the, the blind to, to see. Um, what's also important, and why I, I think it's important to bring it up in this uh, particular setting, um, is that it, it fixes um, cells that are present, um, it puts the gene in that's necessary. In my daughter's case, and in other cases of, of, um, uh, of, of blindness and of, of all sorts of other genetic issues, uh, she doesn't have the cells anymore present so that there's nowhere for the gene to go to fix anything. Um, and that's always something to think about with respect to, uh, to gene therapy. Um, the other reason to bring this up um, is uh, on, on the flip side is that despite the fact that immune gene therapy has gone on probably longer, I believe, in patients than any other uh, form of gene therapy, there are no FDA approved gene therapy products for immune disorders. Um, and uh, they you require being in a, in a trial uh, to get into the many different types of gene therapies there are for immune disorders. But in contrast, um, for uh, labor congenital amaurosis, um, and those who have a genetic, uh, certain types of genetic diseases uh, in the eye, it is FDA approved. So you actually write a prescription, it goes to your insurance, it's an FDA approved drug, you don't have to get into a study, um, and um, the treatment actually works that way. That's the ultimate goal, of course, with all of these gene therapies, is to, for them to become regular parts of clinical practice and not just things that we're all working on um, at the cutting edge. Um, and so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really great example of that. It's one of the very few um, examples of an FDA approved gene therapy um, and um, with, uh, with, remarkable, uh, uh, with remarkable results and, and, and it reflects that. 
Okay, so I'm going to tag myself next and tagging on where you left off, Josh. Um, to my knowledge, actually, the most widely prescribed gene therapy is for a condition called spinal muscular atrophy, which we actually haven't mentioned today. But um, that's actually interesting because that's a neurological condition. Uh, and it used to be, I'll use past tense, used to be the most common cause uh, of death for uh, genetic conditions for individuals less than two years of age in the past. Those days are beyond us, and I think we're way beyond that now. We now have, believe it or not, where almost every baby in the United States is being screened for this condition as a newborn, and as a result, those babies that are identified can get, um, as Katie was talking about, an infusion, an IV infusion as a little baby of this gene therapy, and I am knocking on wood here, uh, maybe a one-and-done treatment for some of them, um, which otherwise would have been fatal oftentimes by their first or second birthday. So this really truly can be transformative. Um, but I also want to be a little bit of a naysayer here in terms of this. Um, it's expensive. Uh, does anyone want to sort of deal with that? I mean, I can say that for SMA, um, this is more than a million dollars in terms of being able to get treatment. So it's great that we've got treatments. Are we going to be able to give everyone access to this? What, how are we going to deal with that problem? I can tackle that one. <laughs> um, so hemophilia is a very expensive disease to treat to start with. Um, so when we talk about sort of what the cost of managing a patient with hemophilia is right now, we would be talking about upwards of probably three or four hundred thousand dollars a year of drug costs for the replacement clotting factor. Um, and so that, you know, kind of gives us an idea of what something where we're talking about replacing years and years of that drug um, of that drug therapy might cost. So when we talk about kind of operationalizing this, we're talking about somewhere in the millions of dollar range um, and to think about that. So we really want to make sure that we, you know, that this works. Um, we really want to make sure that this has great benefit to patients and to, you know, kind of to um, be able to have insurance companies be um, able to cover this and to think about sort of how in our uniquely American healthcare system, um, you know, kind of how these healthcare dollars are spent and, you know, how we um, make sure that patients get access to these therapies. I, I would also just, I would tag one more piece there, which is, um, it's, and it's the same issue with the immune system as it is uh, as the example of the eye that, that I gave. Um, so uh, obviously one of the savings is not to look for two for one uh, sales. That's not really um, the, uh, the way I think that uh, we're going to find that cost savings. Um, but, um, but, but I do think uh, it's important to point out that um, uh, for many of these genetic disorders um, uh, in the eye and in the immune system, uh, the problem can be in a different gene, um, but the way that you correct it is the same thing, right? It's still in the end in the eye, it's an injection of some gene um, it, it, and, and uh, uh, that then goes in and replaces uh, what needs to be done. Um, in the immune system, it's the replacement of some gene um, that's there, but the method that's being used is pretty much the same. And so I think as we begin to get approval um, for fixing one gene in one disease, um, we will hopefully move to starting to get approval for a process um, that will allow many more folks to, many more of these otherwise rare disorders uh, to be treatable and to become therefore more affordable because it's going into more, uh, more individuals. So I think that is a part um, of the way that the prices will come down eventually, because right now, if you've put all your money in treating one single disease that only has a handful of folks to recoup that money, you're going to have to charge an enormous amount. Good point. Josh, although you, I agree with you completely, um, it's not quite so trivial to do this for everything. So in other words, what are the limitations in terms of being able to do this? So I can imagine listeners out there would say, well, in my family, there's X genetic disease. Uh, Dr. Milner has just told me I can be able to have someone pop in my gene because we've got these fancy vectors and you know, just give me that infusion. Um, does it work for everything or what are the limitations in terms of being able to have this cookie cutter solution? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think anytime, you know, when we work in, 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 in individuals with genetic syndromes, um, very often folks get excited about identifying a genetic syndrome because it means that you could just fix the gene, right? Um, as though we could all just go in and fix the gene. And there are 
a lot of limitations um, and um, um, in areas. I, I gave an example where where if 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 the 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 problem the genetic problem that happens leads to the inability to make a certain cell, um, then uh, during development, then putting the gene in the right place won't really do much because the cell isn't there to actually produce what it needs to produce and, and function the way it needs to function. Um, and so when, when the cell that needs to be fixed isn't there at all, uh, the gene therapy is not um, gonna be able to help uh, with that. Um, in the case of immune disorders, um, one of the, uh, the biggest issues is it's not just a matter of replacing something that's not there. And I guess Sujit, uh, you know, uh, touched on this earlier, um, but um, what we actually often have is a, a gene that's being, and, and this is true also, even in uh, genetic disease of blindness as well, where the gene is actually interfering with a process. So you could add more good gene uh, all you want, but if you have a genetic mutation that's actually interfering with the ability of uh, the good copy of the gene to work, um, the replacement's not going to work. And so in that particular case, it really um, gets into questions of, of editing. Um, and gene editing is even farther away than gene uh, replacement. Um, and gene editing in such a way that you put back a normal copy and don't uh, uh, disrupt uh, the way that the, the immune system in, in our case uh, works um, is really not so trivial, um, uh, but it would be uh, the type of gene therapy necessary um, in many diseases and many of the diseases I was just mentioning where the policing isn't there. There are some diseases where there's a protein that's needed to police and if you can replace that protein, you will actually get the, the immune system to police itself. But, but the, the overwhelming preponderance um, are disorders where there's one bad copy um, that's probably turned on too much and causing the immune system to not police itself normally. Um, and that one uh, genetic mutation is interfering with the, the other uh, normal um, uh, version of the gene. Um, and so replacing isn't going to help um, and editing is not at all trivial um, because in some of these cases, if you don't edit almost all the cells, you won't fix the problem. Um, and these are technical issues that are still ongoing, even in people where you could take out their uh, bone marrow, fix it and, and put it back in. Um, there still is this issue that um, uh, it, you have to, in certain cases, correct almost all the cells or you'll still have the, uh, the same problem. So um, that's a major class of limitations um, in terms of gene editing. Um, or editing at the right stage of development. So I'm sure uh, in, in neurodevelopmental disorders where there's a single gene problem causing the neurodevelopmental issue, um, you have the issue of, first of all, trying to actually even get the gene therapy product into a nerve and to, to fix the genetic issue. But the second problem, of course, is that if, if the, the neurodevelopmental process has already taken its course, fixing the protein won't necessarily stop the issues that are happening with neurodevelopment. So that's, a, that's another uh, a set of issues. And I'm sure Sujit has others. Yes, no, so I was just gonna, I was just gonna add um, that, 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 thank you, Josh. That was really um, a, a, a very um, sort of succinct way of, of, of explaining some of these, these problems. And I just wanna add to that. So, you know, when we're talking about doing these transplants, transplants are not trivial. As Monica mentioned, this is a process, and you know you're in the hospital for you know four or five weeks. You have to be followed very closely for a period of time. Um, your immune system is weakened, and then it 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 has to recover from that. Uh, but the other side of things is you know there's concern that you're you're messing around with genes, right? You're messing around with some of these genome, and there's a concern that if this virus that's inserting, or if this editing takes place off target or the, the virus inserts in a place where it can activate something that should not be activated, like what we call an oncogene, a gene that is, is, is likely to predispose you to developing a cancer. And if that gets turned on by some of this off target or um, uh, you, you know, insertional mutagenesis, uh, then that could be a real problem. And so that has been a big concern. And there have been a couple of patients, you know, if you, if you recall the, the early trials of gene therapy in the early 2000s for immune deficiencies, you know, a lot of those patients developed leukemia. And that was as a result of this process called insertional mutagenesis. Uh, 
right? And so that remains a concern even today, even though it's a much, much, much lower uh, concern because one, as Katie mentioned, these are self-inactivating viruses for, um, for thalassemia and sickle cell disease or non-replicating viruses for hemophilia. But still, there remains a concern that maybe there is, that there's a possibility that this, that this sort of thing might happen. In the sickle cell trials, two patients did actually develop leukemia, which are not thought to be related to the gene therapy itself, but it is a concern. And you know we've been following these patients now, not for that long, maybe five to seven years at the most. And so there needs to be more time to follow these individuals as well, so that we can fully understand what the effect of messing around, quote unquote, of, of, of genes actually does to somebody. So I heard a couple people allude to different times in the life course uh, when you might think of doing this. I think I heard Josh, uh, you to say that there's a window of opportunity as you think about things from a developmental point of view. And I was hearing folks um, talk about burden of disease after you've had a stroke with sickle cell or when your bone marrow isn't in such a great shape. So who should think about this? Like who's a good candidate to even think about gene therapy? What are the things that you all think about in terms of um, sort of weighing the risk and the benefit and, and who it falls more on the benefit side? I mean, I think for the hemoglobinopathies, <clears throat> I think it's pretty clear the earlier, the better. These are not diseases you outgrow or out, you know, you don't, they don't get better over time. And so I guess my, I, I think the way I think about it is anybody who I would consider to, for an allo transplant, I would probably consider for gene therapy. So essentially, you know, a patient with sickle cell disease, that's really the only inclusion criteria I really need if they have a matched sibling donor. Because again, we don't know how they're gonna do over time, but we do know that there will be end organ damage, there will be complications, whether it happens early or late. Um, the downside though, unfortunately, as, as I think people have alluded to, is you do have to give these high doses of chemotherapy to young children. And so with that, um, at least in sickle cell and thalassemia, you know, the infertility risk. And so here you are, it is a little bit of a quandary because you're trying to have these patients live long, long normal, healthy lives where they have, you know, a, a family, a job, et cetera. And so they are running the risk of infertility. And so unfortunately, some of the infertility measures when you're prepubertal are still considered experimental. So I think that is kind of a, a risk and benefit. <clears throat> what I've found at least most families like to, to do this treatment somewhere around seven to 10 years of age. But I think, you know, right now it's only on clinical trials. And, and while thalassemia probably seems to be most ahead of the game in terms of getting FDA approval, right now a fraction of people are being offered these treatments. Most of the trials are only offering it to about 45 to 50 people, then they close it. So a very small percentage of patients are actually having access to this disease. And, and if you don't have access to major medical centers, I think that's a problem. Um, so I think that's always something to consider too. I mean, I would love to offer this to everybody, but um, you only give it limited spots. And again, it's, it's just so few centers, so few patients. Um, you know, there's 100,000 patients with sickle cell disease in the country. There's 45 slots. There's millions of people in Africa and India who have this disease who are not, you know, who don't have this ability to get this disease. So, I mean, I think access is so important. Um, and, and hopefully once we get FDA approval, more and more people will be able to get this disease, uh, disease modifying therapy, but kind of like what people were talking about. I think the price tag that people are talking about is just insane at this point. And uh, I, I just, I really don't know how insurances are gonna, hopefully they will. When you look at the lifetime course of patients with sickle cell disease, about 50% of adult patients with sickle cell disease are on disability, not able to, you know, live normal lives, not able to hold down jobs. They're in the hospitals more than they're out of the hospitals. So I think when you weigh the risks and benefits and kind of do a cost analysis, I think it does make sense, but hopefully, you know, we can reduce the cost so that more and more people can have access to, to these therapies. Let me just answer a question that came up in the chat, which is that uh, we are not talking about any gene therapies that alter the gametes, alter the next generation. So this is all what we call somatic, and we're not talking about gene enhancement for any of this. 
Um, I'll just throw out a couple other things, which, you know, some people call gene therapy, some don't. So I'll just be clear about this. But uh, many of us got a vaccine, for instance, that was uh, delivering RNA. Um, and there are also, uh, I'll pull up that, put them in the category of gene therapies, but there are also ways of packaging that RNA and being able to use that as a delivery system that are now in clinical trials for certain conditions, certain metabolic conditions, for instance, that I think about. Um, there are other things which are really altering the way genes work. And so there are some oligonucleotides or ASOs. Um, they do require repeated dosing. So it's not a one and done type of strategy, but that's another uh, treatment that sort of falls within this area or this neighborhood has advantages and disadvantages, as I'll say. And then uh, was already alluded to, but the idea of gene editing. Um, so in other words, going in and kind of fixing the gene, and again, um, has some advantages and disadvantages in some of the, um, as Dr. Milner was talking about, some of the mutations that may not be amenable to gene addition might be amenable to this uh, editing process. So um, within this, there's a broader way as we think about, and um, anyway, I think growing opportunities. Um, as we think about this, though, uh, what when you look forward, when you look about where do you, and I apologize, I didn't sort of give you guys this question in advance, um, but when you think about where are we each going to be in 10 years from now, what do you think the future is going to look like for us? Well, I hope that in 10 years, we are well beyond clinical trials and well into application of these therapies in the real world. Um, you know, as I said before, I am old and I would like to retire. And before I retire, I would like to cure all of my patients. I would like to all of them to be done so that I don't have to transition them or worry about them once I'm retired to say, you know, I wonder what's happening to Sam or to Jeff or to, you know, so I, I really would, I, I really think that it is going to be in, um, in, in application. I, I do think that, you know, I think as Monica mentioned, there's going to be access issues. There's going to be cost issues. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, these therapies are, are a long way off from getting to the developed, developing world where, you know, the infrastructure just doesn't exist for providing these kinds of very complicated therapies, transplant-based therapies, or, you know, so, so I think that, you know, the big picture is, is, is in the long term. But I think that at least in the developed world, these therapies are going to be um, part of the standard of care, standard regimen to offer to patients who might be interested to avail of them. I think that um, one of the things that's going to happen is we're gonna recognize uh, through, to some extent through trial and error in, in, in models or um, uh, maybe sometimes in, in, in patient cases um, where there will be certain areas where gene therapy is the obvious question every time the obvious, uh, excuse me, answer um, to the question every time and certain areas where we're probably gonna stop even pursuing um, gene therapy. Um, whereas I think now everyone just imagines that we'll sort of go after everything and try to edit every gene and everything will be perfect. I think as time goes by, it's become clear there are certain things that um, are, are so difficult uh, to, um, to achieve um, that it's, it's not something, um, at least with the technology that exists right now, that are, that's worth pursuing. Um, and so there will be other ways that people start to um, go after even genetic disorders where the gene has been defined um, and perhaps try to manipulate the pathway in certain ways or uh, uh, that type of a thing. Whereas other things may come up um, that we weren't even thinking about treating with gene therapy um, that very rapidly could become something that could be fixed. Um, there's even discussion of gene therapy for viruses um, to actually uh, uh, give the, the body uh, genes that actually go and uh, uh, encode things to, to kill viruses when the immune system won't do it itself. Um, and um, whereas that RNA vaccine came out relatively, and I say relatively because it's the technology has been there for decades, but um, relatively quickly as, as a way to start delivering uh, proteins to cells, um, which certainly, as, as, as Wendy brought up, absolutely. Um, but there also could be um, a, a ways of delivering proteins to actually fight diseases in really non-traditional ways, but where they work so quickly and so well, the way that the RNA vaccine did, um, that um, we won't even have seen it coming. Um, and, and so here I am predicting that we won't see it coming, but we will, um, that there will be a number of diseases that get treated that way 
Um, I think the important point being is that it's not necessarily the classic way that you think about, oh, I have a genetic syndrome, I just need to wait for gene therapy to be able to fix that particular syndrome. No, I think, I think that's exactly right. I think of this as another tool that we're going to have, another way that we're going to have to offer patients. And it might be sort of the right fit for some patients. It might not be the right fit for other patients. And there may be different times in their life where there's different sort of risks and benefits that really apply to them. Um, so when I think about hemophilia gene therapy, we're offering it to the 18 and above to start with. It's kind of where our clinical trials are focused right now because the pediatric liver is a little bit different. And so we'll have to sort of expand our knowledge before we sort of bring that down. And so I do think these are going to be sort of um, just more opportunities for patients to have choices in the way that they really, you know, interact with the healthcare system for the management of their diseases. Um, and yeah, just to echo, I think what Josh and, and Katie had said, I mean, I think for sickle cell, at least as a sickle cell transplanter for patients who didn't have a sibling, I kind of always feel like you have the haves and the have nots. And, you know, I, I do think people who don't have sibling donors always feel like they are, their child is always at such a disadvantage. And, you know, what can they do to, um, you know, get a donor do, you know, and, and so I think this offers them an opportunity for cure as well. I think, unfortunately, the data is so immature, though, that I don't think we can, at least for sickle cell and even thalassemia, I think the long-term data just isn't there yet. Sujit alluded to the, the leukemia in sickle cell. Sickle cell patients in, you know, inherently have a higher risk of leukemia. So you know, then putting them at risk for another treatment that could increase their risk of leukemia. I think, you know, I just think we need a lot more long-term data before this can be expanded to allow everyone to have this treatment. But I think for people who are really suffering from this disease, and right now it really is only for patients 12 and above who have had significant pain crises or acute chest. So it is reserved for a small number of people, but then you think about the people with strokes who have also had other, you know, horrible complications. And so, you know, the earlier the better has kind of always been my motto as a transplanter, but you know, that I think the chemotherapy becomes a limitation. And there are a lot more studies now ongoing looking at what we call non-genotoxic conditioning where you use antibody um, therapies that can actually wipe out the stem cells and in essence still preserve your fertility. And so I think that those are things that are kind of on the horizon, but um, you know, my hope, I guess, before I retire is that just like Sujit, I would love to cure these patients. I've seen how transplant can transform people's lives, you know, get excited about school, about being able to go swimming in the summer and not get a pain crisis. And I, I just think it really transforms people's lives. And I think every child really deserves that. And, and the nice thing is I think adults now also who really, we always thought were too old to get at uh, this type of treatment can also be offered these treatments. And, and I think just changing the landscape of people's lives, I think it's just, it's very rewarding. And I think we're very fortunate to be part of that. Good. Um, I just see one question in the chat, which I guess I'll take, which is uh, any research on mitochondrial gene therapy, um, just for the aficionados out there, there are two ways that I think of that, those that are encoded by the nucleus, and in the same way that we've been talking about gene editing for that, we think about um, gene editing for nuclear encoded genes. For those that are encoded by the mitochondria, it's a much trickier situation to be able to get to them. Um, and believe it or not, people think of um, things to do to compensate, which is what Josh was talking about in some way. But I do think that's a tougher nut to crack. And I don't, I haven't seen people going at that directly head on in terms of those included in the mitochondria. Um, so we're getting towards the end of the hour. I just want to uh, emphasize that the team here, you may or may not appreciate it, but are really at the cutting edge in terms of what's going, what is being done in this space. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough that Cornell and Columbia and really have expertise that's like none other. So I'm going to ask each of you to give us sort of one parting pearl or bit of advice in terms of something you've learned from this space or something that you think uh, the audience should take away from this. Um, so I'm going to go again in Hollywood Square's order, although you've moved around on my screen. So now it's like random. Uh, but anyway, Sujit, you've got your hand up still. So you get to oh, go right. first. <laughs> I will put it down. So no, I, I, I think that we, we have a lot of reason to be optimistic. We have you know, the, 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 the fantastic thing is that technology is advancing so rapidly. And I think that thankfully, you know, 
besides having new apps on your phone, you're also getting technology to work in the biotechnology uh, arena. And I think that, you know, whatever, whatever we've not been able to do in the you know, early 2000s and even the early uh, 2010s, we are now able to do that with so much more confidence that we're doing it right. And so I think we, we have very much reason to be optimistic. And you know, the only thing I would say is we have to be cautious. We have to, th we have to think this through. We have to look at all the possible effects that this might have and not be too rash in terms of you know, going forward. Can I, can I get gene therapy to, to get you know, more black hair on my head? No, I don't think that's how we should do this. I think we should do this the right way. So I think a thoughtful approach, but an optimistic outlook for me. Good advice, Sujit. Josh, how about you? Um, I think one of the most important things is that to understand how it is that any particular genetic problem ends up being something that someone tries to fix with, um, with, with gene therapy. Uh, to understand that, that that process is essentially driven by patients, it's going to be driven by business, and it's going to be driven by an individual's research interests. Um, and um, it's not like there's some central organization that looks a list and says, well, I think that disease should be tackled next and that disease should be tackled next. It tends to be driven by either a business decision, um, an advocacy decision, um, or which is then tied very often to um, a, a research interest. Um, and um, um, I think understanding how that process works um, can often help in, in navigating um, you know, wh whether whether there's gonna be a, a gene therapy or how to try to get it on someone's radar. Monica? Um, I think I agree. I, I do think there is reason to be optimistic. I am a little cautious um, before we can really expand this to everyone. Um, but I think the opportunities for people are very, um, are out there. I think just like transplant for these you know, we started small, we started with patients who were very, very symptomatic and then expanded to, you know, once we perfected that technique, we kind of expanded it to everybody who had a sibling donor. I think similarly with gene therapy, we're really picking, I wouldn't say cherry picking, but we are really looking at patients who don't have a lot of good options for their disease and offering it to them. And I think the thought process being that if they can tolerate it and there's no long-term effects, I think maybe we can expand it to everybody. But I think that, um, you know, again, only a fraction of patients right now. And I, I just don't think we have enough long-term data, at least head to head to say, you know, at least in the hemoglobinopathy world, you know, what is better one way or another. Um, I think, you know, if you have a sibling, I think I would still advocate for a transplant, but I think if you don't, um, and this does become FDA approved, I think this is something to really consider. But again, just the long-term, the lack of long-term data, I think gives a lot of people pause, which I think is very understandable. Okay. And Katie. I think I would echo um, sort of Monica's sentiment there. I mean, I think that I have cautious excitement is, you know, when I look back to 10 years ago, when I first started um, sort of working in hemophilia, what I did then is very different from what I offer patients now. And the biggest question that I have when I see prenatal consults or young parents is what will this look like when, you know, sort of when my child is grown, when they're going to college, when they're, you know, sort of when we're thinking about their weddings or things like that. And I really am hopeful that I will have answers to those questions to be able to tell them, you know, sort of, I think now we're at the proof of concept stage where this works and we have this potential and what will this look like, you know, further down the line and when we really have those answers to be able to give good advice and to be able to sort of be realistic about how we use this in taking care of our patients. Okay. And I'm going to I think the, we should have the last word. You're a geneticist. I was going to say a so. geneticist and you should be the one to have the last word. Okay, so my last word is everyone has to get to the starting line. So everyone's got to start by getting a diagnosis. And I think that's the first revolution we need to do is get everyone to the starting line. And after that, I will say I'm cautiously optimistic. So as everyone said, I don't think this is going to be for everyone, but I do think there are going to be opportunities for conditions that had no other treatments. You've actually heard about some conditions that even 
though they might not be perfect, at least they've got some treatments. There are conditions out there that we haven't largely touched on tonight that don't have treatments. And I do think this may offer some hope for some of those individuals and those families. So with that, um, I'm sorry, again, we didn't have Max Gomez with us tonight, but I hope I was a good enough substitute. And uh, I wanna thank all of, all of our doctors who were here tonight. Um, again, they are, I can vouch for them. They are incredible people that work tirelessly for their patients. I, I'm not gonna let any of them retire quite frankly. Um, but uh, as they do this, they really are bringing incredible new hope and new opportunities for the patients that we care so deeply about. So I thank you guys all tonight for giving us your dinner time. Um, for those of you who are listening, feel free to contact us in the future. I do see an email in there that we'll try and get back to uh, someone in the in the chat. And uh, anyway, if you, can, if you need us, you know how to find us. Google us and we're all happy to hear from you afterwards. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing job.